thanks for joining me today um, to talk about social prescribing. Would you mind just kind of starting off with your name and just tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, hello and uh, thank you for inviting me. So my name's Sharon, Sharon Nettleton. I'm the community navigator with Imagine If and I work to support in a form of health, well-being, social prescribing um, remit in the coastal cluster surgeries um, for the PCN as their community navigator, a master weaver, if you like, at supporting people with anything that's non-medical. So it's a very wide um, remit um, and it's about just supporting people to find answers that may actually be able to help support their, their health and well-being. So do you work as part of the GP surgery team and the wider roles like adult social care and health? Uh, yes, it's quite it's an integrated role. So it's covering four surgeries, um, although I am based always in the community, but it's working from the community up towards the surgeries and with the surgeries. So I can take referrals from the surgeries, but equally I'm able to um, accept, which I think is fairly unique, referrals from people within the community. Um, hopefully then they don't need to go through the surgery, placing further demands upon the surgery because the answers may very well be available to them through another source, i.e. myself, and we can sort it out between ourselves. Okay, brilliant. And would you say that social prescribing is a fairly kind of new role that's come out of the NHS 10 year plan? So is that kind of part of the different types of roles that are developing around GP practices now? Yes, very, very much so. Um, so everything is new. It's new for the staff in the surgeries and also it's a new concept for people, for patients um, to understand all the different roles that are popping up um, over the past 10 years and particularly at the moment. Um, you can go to the surgery and be signposted not only to the GP, the practice nurse, the pharmacist. Now there's a whole array of people that can support people's well-being. And I think that that's an ongoing piece of um, informal education, um, for want of a better phrase, for people in the community and what's actually available for them. Yeah. And do you work with people of all ages and it's not condition health condition specific? That's that's right. It is all ages. Um, very often it might be working with one or two people within um, a family or a household unit. After all, very often um, where one person may be encountering an issue, there may be others within that same unit that are also um, needing some support to actually get a better outcome for the whole unit, um, the whole family or whatever it might be, the household, um, that's going to be more sustainable going forward. So it's it's a mix. Um, and in particular, uh, if a referral may come in for a person who's cared for, um, very often that is the cared for and the carer themselves. So I will take that as two separate people that I would be supporting because it might be in different ways, but it will bring it all together. And all ages, it might be supporting a parent to support their um, child. Um, and it may also involve actually offering um, some support through the school to enable them to be able to support it. So it's working out who is the best person that's placed and working as a team who is best placed to be able to offer the support. Wonderful. I'm just um sorry about that, Sharon. Um right. <laughs> just also, do you tend to meet people in their own home, out in the community? Does it kind of work where people are? Yes, to coin a phrase that's used quite a lot at the moment, person centered. It's very much around initially it will be a phone call, maybe a text to start with, or an email. Um, just to introduce myself, to work out when is a good time for them as well as for me. But it's it's around working around that person. 
Um, wherever we can, we try and meet in the community or very often some things can be done just down the phone or it can be done through a Zoom style uh, FaceTime meeting. Um, but then it can be at home if necessary in a cafe. For example, I'm going off shortly to meet somebody and introduce them to somebody in the also in the community um, later on today. So that is very much a community morning, community based activity. Um, we might walk and talk. It's it's yeah. it's a complete array, just depending on what's right. Brilliant. And thinking about domestic abuse, do you work with clients with ex experiencing domestic abuse or survivors of domestic abuse? Do you see that in social prescribing? We do from time to time. Um, and I, whilst I fully recognise that my expertise, I don't have the expertise that somebody from one of the recognised charities or agencies have. What we can do, though, is to um, make people perhaps more aware that the story that they might be telling may actually have some links with some form of domestic of, um, violence and therefore be signposting them into the most appropriate. It may be something that they haven't acknowledged that's going on. So I hope very much that we're working with people in a preventative way. It may be not them themselves. It may be, again, as I mentioned earlier, it may be somebody within that family unit that's witnessing something. And again, it's something that can be flagged up. It could be flagged up either to them directly to go and get some further support, or it may be appropriate then to actually um, feed that back into the surgery so that um, health professionals are, are aware of my concerns. Um, I'd like to um, engage further and work more as, as uh, a unit with some of the agencies, if we possibly can, um, not only for training, um, and but to have a clearer understanding of how we work, um, but also to, to build up that close rapport so that it all knits together very smoothly for the person at the middle um, so that they don't feel as though they're being passed around or indeed decide not to continue with seeking the support and um, that they really need. What do you think are the, are the difficulties about and the opportunities for raising awareness of domestic abuse working in local communities like you do and as you say going into people's homes or working with families and that preventative approach what do you think friends and family what, what do you mm -hmm. I think there's still um, maybe in more rural areas, but I, th I, th I think also in many of, um, shall we say, um, some of the demographic areas where we would perceive people to be perhaps more middle class, um, where things may be quietly going on, making an awareness, making people not feel that the service isn't appropriate for them, that they can't approach. I think we always perhaps um, I have done in the past think about it as something that affects maybe younger people um, and and maybe not or or maybe it's within um, a marriage or a partnership but actually um, that's older people it might be um, a carer that's struggling and that there's a lot of interventions they weren't aware that could be put into place. So I think it's it's looking across the board and particularly in rural areas, perhaps, again, where people feel more isolated. They're not sure where to go. They're not sure where the nearest centre centre is or that it applies to them. So I think it's it's we all have a responsibility to making sure that the word is spread about just what the term domestic violence actually um, encompasses. Yeah. And what about training and support in terms of domestic abuse for social prescribers? Do you think there's some opportunities to look at how we can work with more specialist services to be able to develop that kind of resilience to support social prescribers and local communities in a different way with these new roles? Oh, very much so. I think, as I say, to have that awareness, I think for all people, there is a, a constant turnover of new staff coming into the roles across Cornwall, for example. Um, and I think everybody should be aware of 
making sure that people are aware of the full impact and actually looking at it from a preventative rather than we're waiting to actually hear of stories of the violence actually having occurred that we should all be thinking together about how we can look at the, the signals, the signs, what to be looking for and to be absolutely clear um, of the um, protocol, what we should be asking, what advice we should be giving. And that very much, I think, is with these charities to be able to help us to do our work and for them also to know more about what we do so that we can perhaps take some of the burden away from them at times um, by actually then knowing that they can perhaps pass somebody through to our services to support them further in the community. So that kind of referral process working both ways. Two um, ways, yes. And better understanding of what a social prescriber and a health coach and, the, you know, all of those other roles are doing now around in the mm. local communities. Very much so. Very much so, yeah. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks for sharing your thoughts with us today and what you do in your role. And um, hopefully your cafe client goes well in Thank terms you. of linking that person up later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharon. Bye. Bye-bye.